He got into the wrong hands. <laughs> All right, that's an amazing one. Okay, because I, I like to even think that perhaps he lost his vision. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something happened, and, and and this thing, you know, just it just didn't catch the vision anymore. What what else? Got into the wrong hands. Absolutely, it came out dated. It came out. It became outdated. It became outdated. Okay, okay, interesting. So it didn't seem to. To, 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 to run with the time. Somebody abandoned this and somebody else picked it up as trash. Okay? One last one before we go. It wasn't preserved. It just wasn't preserved. The value that was, was put into this thing at creation was not preserved. I just, I'll take you back to last one. Did you want to say something? Yes. It lost its purpose. Is it still working? Yes. Is this why it was created? No. Okay, good. So we realize that how many people think of this and like the way that it occurred to me the other day I saw this in traffic and I took the picture because and I took the picture simply because I heard something in my spirit. And said from the beginning it was not so. Oh. From the beginning it was not it wasn't so. How many people look at this and can say this is the Nigerian story? Yeah. Great potential. From the beginning it was not so. In nineteen seventy four, Finland decided to do something that was apparently supposed to be modeling after the United States. They decided that even though they didn't have a lot of money, that they, there was a belief that if they took the little they had and gave, gave some to countries that needed help, that somehow they would also be able to come into some dimension of prominence. And they wrote 10 countries that they presented to their parliament with amounts that they wanted to give to those countries. The parliament approved nine of those countries, completely tossed one out of the and everybody guess which one it was? Nigeria. Everybody guess why? Because we can't say no to so much potential. All right. So the money wouldn't be used for the right. No, that wasn't what they said. They said that there's no point giving a country that was richer than them, that was a superpower in the making, that how could you possibly even have thought of giving Nigeria money? Eight. How could you? Well, that story was being told, ladies and gentlemen, in 2008, when the then, I believe, Vice President, Dr. Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, was receiving aid presented by the Finnish ambassador. <laughs> so we went from a country that they said needed no aid, and that story was being told when they gave us aid. And we sat down. <laughs> yeah. I want to show you something else. What do you see? Boats. Poverty. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Anything else? Rich and poor. Where is the rich? Yeah. Is this the rich? <laughs> All right, this one. This one, this one. All right, okay, so what do you see? It's a port, yes, it is a port. Well, it's a port city. All right, I need you to understand that a picture was taken from this angle shot in 1960. All right? And in one lifetime, a picture was taken from this very angle again, from this exact angle, using GPS for this picture. So you notice the water here, and this. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. So you can see the same water. So my, my question is, I asked you something. I said, what did you see? 
when you were looking at this. Because clearly, what the guys that built this saw was what they were, this was what they were looking at, but this was what they saw. I don't know whether you get what I'm saying. This didn't, they didn't see this after they built it. They saw it and built according to what they saw. But when they were seeing it, this was what they were looking at. So there is a difference between what you're looking at and what you're seeing. What you're looking at, you have through the benefit of sight. What you see, you have through the benefit of insight, foresight, farsight. And many times when you've got these three dimensions, you can get oversight, capacity to get over certain things that you can see. Does anybody feel me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you sure you come here? Okay, so I want to show you one last interesting thing, and I'm just going to say, when you look at this today, does anybody have an idea where this is? Okay, okay. fantastic. You guys, what, guys, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so this is Dubai in 1990. This is in most of us in, in our lifetime. All right? Now, like most of us, I mean, if you are not born then, it's all right, but <laughs> can anybody tell me what do you think is the economic potential of this business? What do you see? I, I mean, what do you think the sanitary wear business potential of this, of this space is? Uh, uh, construction companies and how many construction companies do you think will be thriving here? <laughs> no. None. Maybe not. None. What about building material companies? <laughs> they won't even touch. Okay? Um, because mostly you would say there's no business, isn't it? Yeah. If you were in the business of sanitary wear and, you, and they said to you, where would you like to go next time? You said, well, I want to go to Dubai. Somebody's going to ask you, are you okay? <laughs> All right. Anybody ever heard the story of a guy who went into into a village, and the two salesmen selling shoes went into a village, and the first guy got into the village, immediately saw the people, packed his luggage, and quickly asked for the next train ticket out of the place. Yeah. Said why? Says they don't wear shoes. There's no market here. Mm. The other guy quickly sent the telex home. Please expand the factory, enlarge your coasts. We've just found the next largest market for shoes. All right? This is exactly what happens when diasporans are gathered together. So many times you kind of like tend to be caught between what to look at and what to see. Okay? And basically what you look at can be something that really makes you very sad. Because many of you are here, and especially in winter, you wish you were not here. <laughs> I can almost put my life on that every winter. You almost say, give me more what you need to do. Or, you know, just wish that. I don't think that there is anyone, no matter how British your and red your passport is, <laughs> that doesn't feel <coughs> the sting of what's happening to your green heritage. Mm -hmm. And every time Nigeria is belittled, berated, something in you probably kicks and wishes you could do more. Anybody like that? Yeah. I guess that's why you're here. So my question is, in 13 years, guess what? Same angle. This is 13 years, guys. So what do you see now? Tell me about construction business. What do you think? Thriving. Thriving. Yeah. Tell me about hotels. What do you think? Because, because people are building, therefore they have to keep them somewhere. Isn't it? Yeah. Tell me about restaurants now. 
Do we do they need hospitals right now? Of course, yes. yes. Okay. W what about do they need drinks and and food yes. business and all of that? Yes. Okay. Schools. Yes. Okay. So what else do you see? I think you guys should be the one telling me. What else do you see now? Transportation. transportation. So now they need transportation, Abby. Yes. Telecommunication because now now they have to go from one place to the other and 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 look at it. Maybe I don't. Know. Can I do something for you? This was the Dubai World Trade Center building, 38 story buildings high, tallest building in Dubai in 1990. This is before it was now transformed and they took it to another building, the Dubai World Trade Center. 38 story buildings high. No, today, if, you, if you're going to do a high rise less than 40 stories high, you need special permission to do that. To build a high rise less than 40 stories high, you need to get a special exemption just for trying to build less than 40 stories. <laughs> They're like, okay, why? <laughs> so you have to justify that there is a specific reason why it has to be less than 40 stories. All right? Let me put it in a way that I hope that you guys can get. This is the power of what a generation can do. Look at it. Can you see it? One generation lives in Dubai with three things. This is all Dubai has, according to the, to the book. And if you, if you guys haven't read my vision, if you ever want to go into any form of nation building, I think that's the first most important book. You please pick up your pen right now if you have, or your phone or whatever, and write down my vision. Challenges on the race to excellence. Yeah. It's a, a book by a guy called Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. I'm going to give you a little shade. Okay? All right? And one of the things he says is that there are three things that Dubai has, only three things. Dubai has sun, sun. Sand, sand, and sea. Obviously, nothing unique about it. What is amazing is that Dubai has sun, sand, and sea here. You can explain that. You can understand. The interesting thing is that Dubai only still has. Sun, sand, and sea. And so you ask yourself, what is it that changed from here to here? Any idea? Vision? Tell me about that. So, so is this, is this, was this building built by government? No. Yeah. So was this one built by government? No. Okay, good. So if they were not built by government, where were these buildings? Here. Thank you very much. These here were visions waiting for visionaries to show up. Dubai didn't get anything more. Dubai does still not, does not have any oil. Their, their rich cousins, Abu Dhabi, have all, all the oil. But Dubai does not even have enough oil to be considered a, 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 an oil-rich region. I don't know whether you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Let me show you something about this. Look at this. All right? Think of all, same angle shot, guys. From here to here. Same water. These are GPS positioned pictures. All right? Look at this. This is the Dubai Abra, also known as the Dubai Creek. This creek is the same as this. This is 1979. This is 2010. Anybody see what I'm saying? What are you seeing now? <coughs> transformation. Oh, transformation. Interesting. <laughs> Let me show you another interesting one. Can you see this building? Go what? Can you see this? What's this? Okay, good. This is just, this is about 20, 20 something years. Can you see this? This is Sheikh Zayed Road, the, la the major road in Dubai. Uh, look at this roundabout right here. Can you see this? So what do you think is the size of the economy of Dubai here? Hmm. Maybe you don't. Okay, if I were to ask you by how many times factor do you think the economy has increased from here to here? 
<laughs> All right, let me see if I can still do something. This is Al Maktoum Bridge. One way going, one way coming. This is Al Maktoum Bridge with the same sun, sand, and sea. Six lanes going, six months coming. You might, well, you might say, well, they didn't take any cars on this road, but they did. They took one truck. You know, then they tried to make it on the way back. Do you notice that there were not many cars as long as there was only one lane? Yes, that's true. What is the point that I'm trying to make? Summarize, anybody? Just kind of, please. Anybody, can you please summarize this for me? Anyway, the people that build the nation. The people that build the nation, thank you. That's a good one. Any other one? Build their milk up. Huh? Say it loud enough, please. Build it and they will come. Build it and they will come. Build it and they will come. Okay? Build it and they will come. Okay? Build it and they will come. Anybody else? Go ahead. It takes vision to do what? To build. Just because. Go ahead. Sorry. Leadership as well as vision because there's a distinction between vision and leadership. Vision is seen. Leadership is taking the taking responsibility to make that vision happen. I love that, but I just want to be clear that you and I are on the same page. Yes, sir. Leadership at what level? Personal level. Thank you. Because I think that one of the greatest challenges that most people have is thinking that leadership is the them that we are waiting for to do it for us. I don't know whether you get what I'm saying. All right. So, so, so I just wanted to be clear that that was how you felt. Okay. So amazing. Now, guys. Let me see if I can run you through a very interesting, very quick presentation. Now, let me warn you, it is a bit theoretical, just a bit, but it is good for you to know this and have an understanding of how nations are built. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, let me move fast and furious. <laughs> okay. All right. So, everybody knows this great guy, yeah? What's his name? Yeah, okay, wonderful. He said something that, in my own opinion, literally just wraps it up in a way that I love. He said, sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great. And speaking to a group of <coughs> young South Africans at that time, he said, you can be that great generation. And then he puts a little caveat. Sounds like an instruction, but in my mind I hear, but. But you must let your greatness blossom. And in saying that, greatness is a potential that you have the responsibility to project. Because greatness can sit in you and nobody will ever see through you. And one of the things I always say to you is like, look, you know, God has to help us Africans. Because I mean, I, 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 please forgive me, but this is just the way I feel. Because I'm wondering how does any continent that experienced someone like Nelson Mandela get to choose Jacob Zuma? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just my, that's, that's the way I feel. How do you go from knowing this kind of ideal to choosing and defending this other kind? I mean, it's, it's just, it's, yes, please, go ahead. Tell me. Um, Nelson Mandela is the You need to throw your voice loud enough. Sorry, Jacob Zuma portrays the mindset of the people. Yes. Yes. And yes. that is why he's in leadership. Because they, whoever leads the country also shows the mentality, the mindset yeah. of, of, of the people. Interesting. So, that's, that's, that's so, so, so you think Jacob Zuma shows the mindset of South Africa? Or a... Well, okay. I'll yeah, leave that. I, I, no, I, I, actually, I'm not going to go into that political <laughs> science. I just know that one thing is for sure. Right? I believe that a generation can become great. And most times, greatness chooses a generation you don't even have to choose to be great. I believe that there are times when providence bestows greatness upon your generation. And that you're born at such a time that greatness was upon your generation. And it's up to you to recognize that this is what has happened to our generation. It's not because we wanted to be great, it's because greatness was bestowed upon us. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, and I hope that by the time I finish this presentation in something like 30 minutes or so, right, I pray that you will understand 
the greatness has chosen your generation. Yeah. And that wherever you are from across the world, you can respond to that greatness. Or you can choose not to. At great peril and pain. Because greatness is a great rewarder. But the neglect of greatness is a great pain. This gentleman, I referred to a few minutes ago, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al said something that just completely shattered my world. He said, if an endeavor is not nearly impossible, it's not worthy of pursuit. And you see, when I read this guy's book, I began to understand that Dubai was not built by accident. I, I began to recognize that, that what you see and you know, everything you saw didn't happen by chance. That there is a mind frame that produced the results that we see and we admire. One of the things that he said that was amazing was that nobody comes to see another of anything, but everybody <coughs> comes to look for the first of everything. Okay? He said, if it's not first or only, no one is going to come. So anything you want to build in Dubai had to become an S to it. So, they, so he, he had a vision that said by 2010, he wanted Dubai to be the, what you call the destination capital of the world. And he wanted 10 million visitors to visit Dubai, spending an average of $10,000 each. That would have brought them to $100 billion flowing into, the, into this desert. $100 billion flowing into this desert. And the simple strategy was very, very, very simple. Let's build the best city of the world. So if it's going to be the, if it's going to be tallest, it will be the tallest. If it's going to be wide, let it be the widest. If it's going to be deep, let it be the deepest. If it's going to be, you know, whatever. If it is not est, don't do it. Because if, it, if you do it, nobody is going to come to see it. But if it is an S, then everybody will come. Now, just to quickly help you understand that by 2007, they had met their goal. 2007, 12 million people visited Dubai. The Dubai port, uh, airport, and I will show you, I hope I can have a few pictures to show you there. <coughs> this was what their, pit, their airport looked like a few years ago. All right? So it's the Dubai International Airport. Okay? It's very international. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know what it looks like now? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> okay, so what are you going to say to me now? <laughs> is it please? <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is just oh, an angle, one of the entrances of that is. Now, the point is, how do you go from here <laughs> to here? Because this must have been impossible in the minds of somebody at this time. But he says that's exactly why we need to build it. And I love the way that um, Godman said it. If you build it, they'll come. Well, 86 million people traveled through the airport of Dubai in 2012. 86 million people. Just because they built it. Remember, this is the big idea, guys. I want you to remember this. So, sun, sand, and sea. Sun, sand, and sea. That's where. What kind of mindset creates this? If it's not impossible, it's not worthy of pursuit. 15% of the world's cranes were in Dubai at one point in time. 15% of every crane, tower building crane in the world. They built a 40 block building. 54 stories high in eight months. Safe and sound. Right? And you could see something that they did that was very interesting. So that whilst they were building, they had started painting. I'm not just talking about one coat of paint. I'm talking about this is the first coat of paint. See the second coat of paint already going on it. So they were still building it. <laughs> they built this 40, this particular project, 40 blocks of 54 story buildings in Dubai. And they finished the 40th one within the third year of finishing the first one. So they were building them together. All right? They were building them all together. And you can see what it is. And this is an interesting thing. They work night and day. 
So they, they have six working days in Dubai, all right? And the only day they don't work is Friday. But they also have three ships that work in Dubai. And on a construction site, your, whatever tools you are using must be on and working when you hand it over to the next person. So that, that means that they have to be sure that they didn't inherit their tools from you. So no downtime. Same thing with their taxes. All right? So what these guys did was they collapsed time. They didn't take shortcuts, guys. They just took a fast track. And so what I'm trying to help you understand is that, I mean, you said something that was amazing about how China <coughs> industrialized in 30 years. These guys are doing this in less. Why? Because every time somebody has done something, then what eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, what has not come into the minds of men is what is left for you to do. Mm. Does anybody understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. So we got to understand that. Now, what is it that makes Dubai safe? Just the shared number of people that are out there working at night. What makes most countries unsafe? The shared number of people that are not out there. If you put 3 million people on the streets of Lagos out there working at night, you will need to power them and that will provide lights. There will be not enough there's just not enough darkness for thieves to think we can operate. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. So let me put it this way. There is a, a direct correlation between national development and business development. It's a direct correlation. If the nation is progressing, the nation will prosper. But once you don't put the nation on the path of progress, the nation cannot be on the path of prosperity. And I hope that I'll be able to show you some of these things. Let me just give you one last thing, a few, and then I focus on the real work that needs to be done. You know, hey guys, look at this. These are estates that were built in Dubai that can be seen from outer space. They're called eight wonders of the world. All right? One of them, this small one, is called the Palm Jumeirah. And many, of, many of you may have been there already. This one is called the World. And I just want to show you. So they sand field land. Why? They, because the ruler of Dubai said he wanted 10 kilometers of beachfront for the people of Dubai. So what, what does that mean? So if you measure all of the linear distances of all these this beachfronts, it comes to 10 kilometers. All right? This is what it looks like. And just so that you can understand, this is that how they built it. All right? Look at it. So each home now has a beach. All right? Did he know how to do this? No. But once they said we want it, let me put it this way. Your mind produces whatever your heart desires. I want you to write it down. Your mind produces whatever your heart desires. The greatest challenge that we have is when the heart is filled with hate, <laughs> as opposed to love. Mm. Because hate cannot, cannot produce things. Hate destroys things. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. So when you feel bad about a country, and you begin to say, that goddamn country, there is no inspiration that can come into your heart. Yes, to be able to begin to build or produce anything. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Yes, yes, and, and so these guys were not limited by what it was they inherited. I want you to write that. They were not limited by what they inherited. They decided that they could do more. And so, let me just move on. I mean, look at, look at what they did. Just look at the detailing. Okay? This, the world is an estate that each plot is called by the name of a country. country. No. no. <laughs> I honestly wish that. But, but, it's not. but Rod Stewart, Madonna, um, Sean Connery have islands here that are called by the names of England, Scotland, Ireland, you know, blah, blah, blah. All right? 
This was built at a cost of seven million US dollars. So at, this was a conceptual thing. By the time they finished building this plot, ladies and gentlemen, each one of them was worth 50 million dollars. So if you bought it at offtake level, which is when it was still concept, you pay seven million dollars. But the only reason why people will put $7 million down is that they knew that if you put $7 million down, your money will not go to it. Hmm. That these guys will deliver what it is that they said they would deliver. So it was more about reputation and brand, which I hope I will be able to show you the link between values and value, the value of the nation, that, that makes this happen. And they, 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 did, they, they built it, guys. They just, they just built it. <coughs> Let me tell you what they're working on, one of the things that they're working on, and, and um, by 2019 or 2018, they should be able to finish the first estate. Now, how many people know that the world is currently spinning? <laughs> but do you feel it? No. Okay, so based on that idea or ideology, they said it, it must be possible for a, for a building to spin around and the people who are inside will not know it. So that you wake up one day and you're facing one side of Dubai, and then maybe in about four or five days, you just realize, oh, I've seen a different view of Dubai, but you cannot tell when the house moved. Every level has its own two parking spot garage. So you drive your car into the lift, it takes you to your floor, you reverse out. When you're going home, you again, you're going to go out, you drive into the lift, it brings you down, and all of that. Okay? But and just so that you guys don't think that this is the, this is what is the model is going to do. So it's going to be spinning around, and this is what the estate is going to look like. They're working on it, and they hope that by 2019 it will be finished. All right? My question again is, what is that mindset? Can anybody remind me? T tell me what the mindset is again. Remember, what was it that we said the mindset was? If it is not enforceable, impossible. it's not worthy of your use. Can I ask you to please ask someone that you like around you? And you may not know them, but if you don't like the person, do ask them. <laughs> Just, and, uh, you know, just ask them what impossible thing are you currently trying to do? What is impossible? What? Perhaps you don't, let's see if I can put it in a way that I hope will be useful to you. Okay, if you are not giving for an impossibility, you are not living a true, a true life of, 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 of greatness. You are you're, you're <coughs> mediocrity. If you're not trying to do something that has never been done before, then you're wasting time. You're using somebody else's breath. Right? right? So, so my point is this. When, what is Gemstone trying to do? It's a very simple. We're trying to do the impossible. We believe that Providence has chosen a generation and empowered and motivated and inspired us to choose to operate with natural excellence, to make excellence our second nature. And that as ambassadors of that, this gemstone, we have the capacity to build Nigeria into a nation that all the six continents of the world would like to do business with, would like to live in, would like to work in. We believe we have the capacity to do it. We believe that the children that have left Nigeria from the six geopolitical zones will one day want to come back home not out of plea, not out of compulsion, but out of hope and out of expectation of the opportunities that lie ahead so that they say this is the place. Nobody's going to cajole anybody to come back home. And please, just in case you thought I came here to come and beg you on those kind of things, Rest your mind. <laughs> I have a bigger role for you. There is no nation that has ever become great without its diaspora. Mm. And I will show you even Nigeria, in its time of greatness, it was its diaspora that made it happen. Mm. All through Africa, Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, um, you know, in, in, in Tanzania, um, Jomo Kenyatta, all of these guys left their home to go out to get a new thinking. And the thinking they were able to acquire was higher than the thinking that created the problems in Libya. The only thing was that they didn't get that thinking for themselves. Understanding that no candle is lit for itself. 
Yeah. The purpose of the the purpose of lighting a candle is not for the candle. Mm -hmm. It's so that other people can see. Yes, yes. So if you are lit but you don't go back and provide light in the darkness, then your candle light is wasted. Mm. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, people have beat their children for putting on the light in the afternoon. Maybe not here. <laughs> <laughs> but the same child that got beat for putting on the light in the afternoon to bed to put on the light in the dark. The same child. So I, I, have, I need you to understand the value of light is darkness. Mm. Without darkness, light has no value. So that if you have acquired knowledge, but your knowledge is not able to produce solutions, then your knowledge is in vain. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. So, so I just need you to understand that all of this is, why on earth are we here? Well, somebody tell me what you see here. Oh, come on, be confident about it. Science. No, 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 no. Let's do it as one people Science. under God. One, two, three, go! Science! Say it again. Assumption. Assumption. Tell me about that. It, just, uh, it looks like, and because it's what you've been saying before, your mind just quickly says, that's what it should be. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I love that. Assumption is the lowest form of knowledge. Assumption is the lowest form of knowledge. Ah, I love that. I love that. Somebody needs to tweet here. <laughs> All right. Anything, anything else? Because it looks like it doesn't mean it. Because it looks like it doesn't mean it. Anybody else? One more. You have to go deeper to see what it really says. You have to look beyond the obvious. And I think that many times when you look at Nigeria now, people are saying science. People are not seeing beneath the obvious. They're not seeing what's going on, and therefore you can misread everything that you're seeing. It doesn't mean it doesn't look like it. But I just wanted to say to you, be careful. There are possibilities that we need to see. You need to be able to understand and reprogram your mind to, to capture the essence of what's going on here. Now, I want to help you understand something that I call the difference between country and nation. And, and let's see whether we can do this very quickly. You see, a country is an amalgamation of landmass. Usually, countries are defined by borders and boundaries. So, that is a country. All right? But, nations, on the other hand, are different. Let me give you an example of July 8, 2011. This is the country of Sudan. July 9, 2011, this is the country of Sudan. It's not North Sudan, still Sudan, but the land mass has changed. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Because another nation came out of it. And by the signing of a promulgation. Let me go on. So country is about land, but nation is about, it's about people. So you don't have a nation until the people have three things in common. Number one, they must have a common heritage. Number two, they must have a common language. Number three, they must have a common belief system. You have to do this quickly because I think it's eight o'clock already. So let me give you an example of a nation. Okay? Long before all of this happened, these guys, remember, they were known as a Jewish people. They had a common heritage, sons of Abraham. They had a common language called the Hebrew language. Even though they were living in Poland, Russia, they would say all those things, speak their language, but they had their own language, which was Hebrew. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? And then they had a common heritage, which is a, cult, I mean, uh, a common custom. Okay, And so they would celebrate all their feasts at, on the same day across the world. They didn't have land, but they were a nation. They had a flag, but they didn't have land. I don't know whether you understand. So you see here a nation that did not have a country of their own. Let me give you another interesting one. There's another nation, Kurdistan. Anybody ever heard about the Kurds? Yeah. They are a people recognized by the United the nations. nations. But they don't have any country called Kurdistan. In fact, Kurdistan is a region <laughs> spread out over four countries. Turkey, 
Iran, Syria, and Iraq. Are you still with me? Yeah. I hope this is not too this is not too theoretical, yeah? Good. So listen to this. If Kurdistan were to become a country, it would be bigger than Syria. <laughs> and it is oil rich. So these guys will never let go of these people, even though they are a common people with one common heritage, common language, a common belief system. Let me give you another one which is not here. Tibet. Okay? Tibetans are, in a sense, they are a people in China, but they are a nation. They have the Dalai Lama as their spiritual head. They have a president. <laughs> Who is, cannot step into China, but is elected by the people? <laughs> okay. Does anybody understand where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. So now let's come to this amazing country. Mm -hmm. or amazing. Nigeria. Do we have a common heritage? No. Okay, some people say we are sons of uh, Odudua. And now I say we are some of Mandafodio. And now we are, you know, you know what I mean. Do we have a common language? No. no. Do we have a common belief system? No. So is Nigeria a country or a nation? It's a country. Good. The danger with countries, as you need to know, is that, listen to this, countries fracture a line around nationalities. So if you don't pull a country together, the Ijad nation, common heritage, common language, common, Unbelief. will begin to feel different from the Urobo nation. And Urobo nation will begin to feel different from the, the Shakiri nation. And the Shakiri, now, the only beautiful thing that is, in, in my own opinion, that is the thing about Nigeria, is that there are at least 240 nations in Nigeria. And what is the good thing about that? We are too many to break. <laughs> The splinter of Nigeria is practically impossible. Because you think Yoruba is a nation? Wait until you break Yoruba. Then you hear that Ijebu say, wait, wait, wait. I'm different from Ijebu. Then the Ijebu Tesha will say, ah, we are not Ijebu, we are not Ijebu. Yeah. <laughs> you want to break up Lagos? Then you will know that Ekpe is different from Badagi. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We are unbreakable because the splinter is just too fractured. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So don't let anybody scare you about Nigeria breaking up. It's impossible. I'm telling you why. It's not whether it's because I just like Nigeria. The Hausas are not a people. Break Hausa up. That's when you begin to know that there is food to us. <laughs> and then there's, you know, and then there's Fulani, and then there's, and they are all different. They don't even speak the same language. No. There are 540 languages in Nigeria. Yeah. We are the United Nations of Nigeria. <laughs> That's true. Does anybody understand? <coughs> the question is, has any country with so many different nationalities ever become great? Anybody? India. Interesting. That's the one I, I do check. Any other one? Great Britain. Great Britain. Different nationalities. Yeah. Okay? Speaking different languages. Yeah. You know, I always keep saying to people, at what point in time did Great Britain become great? Yeah. <laughs> Who, you know, somebody must have woken up one day. Great. Oh. It's a great day. This is not Britain. This is great Britain. I want to say that's true. <laughs> yeah, obviously, it must have been around when England, Scotland, and Ireland began to come together, blah, 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 blah. But somebody thought to themselves, we are not just, we are not, this is great. They, I believe they called it great before they saw the greatness. Yes. Yes. If somebody can say great Nigeria, I'll be very happy. Great Nigeria. Some of you are going to either call it great when you see it with your eyes. Mm. So I call them believers. <laughs> <laughs> believers, listen to this. Believers, with them, believing is seeing. What you believe is what you will see. see. Yeah. Unbelievers, seeing is believing. Mm -hmm. So God, so Jesus said to, to Thomas, He says, It's good that you saw and you believe. Mm. He says, But blessed are those who believe what I've not seen. All right? 
tell somebody you need to be a believer. All right? Think about this one. Right? Remember that the United States was made out of 50 colonies, all of them independent. Texas was the last country to join the United States. All right? But that's not all. If you look at it, there are Irish Americans in Boston and all of those kind of things. There are, there are French Americans in New Orleans. There are Native Americans. There are African Americans. How did these guys of different origins come together to become one great <coughs> I believe that that question is best understood when you get this. That the first thing they had to do was to define a purpose. And they said to themselves, why we came may be different, but why we are here must be the same. I don't know whether you get what I'm saying. So it doesn't matter whether it was the British that brought us together. That was why we came. Question is, why are we here? All right? Mm -hmm. Number two, they had to frame their purpose into an assignment. Mm -hmm. And then number three, they had to describe what that assignment having been accomplished looks like. In other words, what does mission accomplish look like? What does success look like? If we do a great job on our mission, what does success look like? And then having understood these three things, they had to define the last and the most important one. What is going to guide the way we relate to each other? What's going to guide us in the way that we deal? Okay? Let me see if we can move faster. Many people say Africa is rising, Abi. And I say to some people, when I, when I show this picture, usually sometimes I ask them, what do you see? Some people say, ah, Africa is sinking. <laughs> <laughs> some other people say, oh yeah, Africa is rising. But you know, it's amazing about how one thing nobody can understand about this thing called Africa is how is such a blessed continent yet riddled with such great poverty. And I think that it's basically because people don't understand that many times potential may not always be obvious. I think that this is like Africa. In fact, it's like Nigeria. <coughs> Yeah, the guys that have very little are, puff, they are puffing, they are skanking, they are thinking, ah, what's that? Look at us. <laughs> Yet these guys are standing here and constantly looking to these guys and admiring these guys, forgetting what it is that they're going to And I'm not talking about oil, guys. Don't get me wrong. What's the potential that they're sitting with? I believe that many times this is a disguise. Corruption is a disguise. I believe that unemployment is a disguise. I think it disguises the things that we are really sitting on. But they're not real. Once we get those things out of the door, the question is who's going to be ready to take it out? Because guess what? I think some of these guys are beginning to think, hmm. There's a report that was done about three years ago that said that 68% of the world's resources required to sustain the world in the 21st century are in Africa. <laughs> All right? And with every time you watch CNN or BBC and you see a big flood, that number just went down somewhere, whether it's in the US. The kind of floods that they're dealing with, a lot of American farmlands has been ravaged by floods. That they cannot plant for the next <coughs> two to three years. And yet, Africa is preserved, pristine. But the question is, what are you looking at? Let's move forward. What has been the real problem of Africa? What's stopping us? I didn't mean to come and give you guys an uppercut. <laughs> Just lock me the way I am, okay? I think that the greatest problem with, with Nigeria, as with Africa, is its privileged class. I think the people who have privilege believe that as long as they are okay, they are okay. That if I can escape and I can have light, then praise God. That if my own children can go to a good school, then it doesn't matter what's going on here. In fact, as long as I have a Jeep, it doesn't matter. Our roads can be bad. Yeah. That's their problem. Yeah. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. But they don't understand that privilege is a gift from a nation and an investment in the people. That when the nation invests privilege in you, for whatever it is, 
by any kind of opportunity, it is so that you take that which you have acquired by privilege and you make it available to everyone. So, so if you look at great nations, right, great nations, get the privileged people to go to medical school, but then they make health care available to all. They get the privileged people to be able to go to engineering school, then they design cars for all. They get the privileged people to be able to go to technical school and then build roads for all. Every time you take privilege and make it available to all, you have security or prosperity. In a sense, listen to this. Your prosperity is not secure until everyone else begins to prosper. Yes. Uh, there's an African proverb that says, when my, my neighbor is hungry, my chicken is not safe. So my point is this, and, and I need to get this to a, to a quick, quick conclusion. It's the way we see things that matters. Mm. Guys, so what do we need to see? Let's <coughs> quickly put it under here. The human race is not a race between the, the Caucasian and the Asian, the Hispanic and Forget that nonsense. The human race is a race against time. And it's a relay race. Where every generation must run their own race and hand over the baton to the next generation. Uh, right? And, 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 and by getting off the track does not mean that you are still not a part of that race. You can decide that I'm not going to run that race here. It doesn't matter for me. I'm not, all I'm going to do is just do my own thing. But let me help you understand. We have something that we must bequeath to the next generation. Ladies and gentlemen, let me help you understand what the baton is. There are three most important things you must give to the next generation. I'm going to give you to you in quick succession. Number one, you must give the next generation the right values. When you give the next generation the right values, you give them the opportunity to thrive in wherever they find themselves. Number two, you must give the next generation the right environment for those values to thrive. And number three, you must give the next generation the right name. Give them a name that opens doors for them, not a name that shuts doors for them. Give them a name, a brand, that when they say I'm Nigerian, opportunities for them to use those values you've given them begins to shine. Doors open up for them. Give them a right name that whenever they mention your name, Opportunities open up for people who bear that name. Be because depending on how you live your life, your name will either be a padlock or a key. Mm. Mm. If your name is a key, doors open up for the people. If your name is a padlock, doors lock up. So I need you to understand that. Okay? Every generation is a link to the next generation, but we are more than just time and space. Listen, guys. For you to define an active generation, a correct generation, it has to have the following things. And, and, and time is really, really, really against me here now. Right? Number one, we must agree as one people. This is what makes an effective generation. Number two, you must speak with one voice. Number three, you must act with one purpose. You must act with one purpose. And number four, you have to... Create with the same image. Okay. Okay, so a ge an effective generation. All right. Is one people with one voice. I want to show you an effective generation <coughs> of Nigerians, then I'll talk about our generation, and then we'll bring this to a close so you can have interaction. All right? All right? Um, so, I, I just need to. So, there is a generation called the Generation of Liberation. Anybody remember them? Yeah. Yeah. Every time you sing that song, for those of you that ever sang it, the tables of our heroes past shall never be. Which images come into your mind? These three guys. Okay? Question I've always asked is is it that there have been no heroes since these guys? Maybe not. But listen, regardless, I am bent on one thing. My children and my children's children will not be thinking about these guys not while I'm alive. How dare us, a living generation, be so irrelevant to the memory of a children that did not even experience them, 
that they will be thinking about people that are dead mm -hmm. as heroes. Don't you understand it? I, this is the past of the future. Today is the past of the future. So when they are talking about the labels of the heroes past in the future, they are talking about the heroes today. My question is, when they sing that song in 10 years, will your face show up in their minds? Yeah. What would you have done that will cause them to think of you as a hero? Because I can tell you what these guys did. Let me tell you what they did so you can get it right. Number one, they were able to identify a purpose. And their purpose was liberation. They said, we are alive for such a time as this to liberate our people from the powerful British government. And then they decided to come up with a mission. And they said, let's give an assignment to our purpose. And that assignment must be self-governance. That if we can govern ourselves, we will have accomplished liberation. And then they set a vision of mission accomplished. Not that if we can have Independence Day, then we would have accomplished our mission, and then we would have accomplished our purpose. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Yes. And then they also set the right values. My question is, does your generation have a clear purpose? Does your generation have a clear mission? Does your generation have a clear vision? Now let us ask, whose responsibility is it to come up with the purpose of a nation? Okay. Government? No. Do you think that the British government came together and said, please come guys, please come. We just want you to know what your purpose is. Liberation from us. Is that, is that what you think happened? No. Do you think they were able to help them say, listen guys, five lessons in self-governance, do you think that was what happened? All right? Do you think that the British government said to them, one day I see four little children. Is that what happened? Mm. It is not necessarily a government that comes up with purpose, mission, and vision. And as long as you are waiting for it to be given to you by Vision 2020 or Vision 2010 or Vision 2000, <laughs> you will find out that it never comes from the people, therefore it never inspires you. I don't know whether you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it that is our purpose? Well, remember, the challenge is that when these guys accomplished their purpose, they had only one little problem. They had accomplished their purpose. <coughs> therefore, the purpose had changed but they didn't change with the purpose. Yeah. So every, if you listen to what the speech that was given Saturday, the 1st of October, everything was talking about where they were coming from, nothing was talking about where they were going. Mm. You can go download that speech. There's nothing that talks about the vision for the new Nigeria, not a thing. They were talking about thanking the people and saying, yeah. you know, 14, what you're seeing today is the combination of 14 years of active effort, mm. collaborative effort. 14 years from 1960, ladies and gentlemen, was 1946. In 1946, Aulawa was 37 years old. Papa Balewa was 34 years old. These guys were not old men, they were young boys. But that was not all. They were young boys with no money, no pedigree, nothing. That was what made their mission impossible. That's what made them heroes. My question is, do we have a mission impossible? I believe we do. I believe we do generation emerged that literally called itself a wasted generation. Many times people say, how could you have said that Walesha Ika, you're too intelligent to say that. But Walesha Ika said something that was very interesting. He said the purpose of every generation is to give an advantage to the next generation. So every generation that has a disadvantage to the next generation is a wasted generation. So, so in my own simple understanding, a wasted generation is a generation that locks, lock, locks out light from its bulbs, that dries up water from its taps that knocks out education from its schools, that yeah. knocks out health from its hospitals. Yeah. A wasted generation knocks out safety from its roads and knocks out value from its currency. A wasted generation, in my own opinion, knocks out values from its children. The question is, what is it that spoke at his 70th birthday? That was 11 years ago, but it seemed like three, three, maybe three years. It won't be long before you are 70. And at the age of seven...